Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Moroz and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today's speaker is Dr. Amy Shabbat, Research and Conservation Programs Coordinator at the African Lion Safari. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. If you are in the Regina area, check out our Owls on Tour Native Prairie Speaker Series at Cabela's Regina on February 9th at 2 p.m. Join us for our next Native Prairie Speaker Series webinar on February 28th at noon. Sean Chuan with Rangeland Research Institute at the University of Alberta will be talking about rangeland management and carbon sequestration. Save the date, March 17th to 23rd is PCAP's Prairie's Got the Goods Week. Join us for a week-long webinar series about ecological goods and services provided by native prairie grasslands. To register or find out more information about past or upcoming presentations, please visit the PCAP website, www.pcap-sk.org. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Crescent Point Energy, Sask Energy, TransCanada Corporation, Canada North Environmental Services, Information Services Corporation and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsor is Eco-Friendly Sask, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the African Lion Safari and Loggerhead Shrike Working Group. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. And now a bit about today's presenter. Amy first in became involved in research and conservation of the loggerhead shrike in 1991 when she quantified the reproductive biology and habitat requirements of the species in Ontario and Quebec for her master's thesis. She continued to work with the species while employed at Bird Studies Canada and later as a biological consultant. The loggerhead shrike was the focal species for Amy's PhD research during which she reassessed the species taxonomy using morphological and genetic markers and quantified patterns of migratory movements. Amy has served as a scientific advisor to the Eastern Canadian Loggerhead Shrike Recovery Team since the mid-1990s and is the coordinator of the North American Loggerhead Shrike Working Group founded in 2013. Amy completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the African Lion Safari in Cambridge, Ontario in, 26 in 2016, during which she assessed diversity of genes involved in immune system function in the captive population of loggerhead shrikes. In 2017, Amy was hired as the African Lion Safari's first research and conservation programs coordinator, where she continues to coordinate collaborative research on both wild and captive populations of loggerhead shrikes. So with that, I'd like to tell everyone I'm really excited to, to hear this awesome presentation by our expert, Amy, and I'll turn it over to you, Amy. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've just done show my screen. This is the first time I've done this sort of venue. Perfect. And it looks like you're good to go there. Okay. And all right, I guess I'll just get whoops, get started. Um, so thank you to everybody out there who's listening in. Um, so, so this is the first time I've done a webinar, so it's a little bit unusual, but um, hopefully you'll learn something today. So I'm going to be talking about conservation of the loggerhead shrike. The loggerhead shrike um, is a, a medium-sized songbird. They average about half the size of a robin. Um, their wings are black and they have white wing patches on them, which are best seen when they're in flight. Their tail also is black, which has a white edge to it as well. Males and females are very similar in appearance. The males do tend to have a whiter colored breast and the females a tanner hue to the breast, but it is actually quite difficult to tell the two apart. 
The juveniles look very similar to adults as well. They have faint barring on their breasts that they lose after their first molt. Overall, their feathers are a bit browner and um, their, their mass a little bit less distinct than the adults. There are only two species of true shrike in North America, the loggerhead shrike and the northern shrike. The loggerhead shrike, though, is the only species of shrike which is endemic to North America alone. The two species are very similar in appearance. Um, both of them have a black eye mask. And while you can discern them by beak length and shape, with the northern shrike being slightly longer, um, sharper bill, and a slightly bigger bird overall, the mask is really the best way to tell these two species apart. On the loggerhead shrike, it extends across and over the bill, whereas in the northern shrike, it does not. So the loggerhead shrike um, is a songbird or a passerin but it has a raptor-like hook and tomial tooth on either side of its beak. This allows it to take vertebrate prey by very quickly biting through the cervical cord. The species also has very large jaw muscles, which is needed to give the beak a powerful bite. And this gives the species a very large headed appearance, which is where it gets its name loggerhead from, which means block headed. The bill of the shrike is very functionally similar to the bill of falcons, and this allows the species to be a top predator of small vertebrates. And it sets it apart from other songbirds, giving it a unique position in the food chain. But shrikes don't have the strong talons of, of falcons and other raptors, and so they have to impale their larger prey items on sharp objects such as barbed wire or thorn, or they'll wedge it in the crotch of a tree. The impaling behavior thus represents an adaptation to the problem of how to deal with large prey without having the talons of a raptor. Loggerhead shrike has a breeding range that goes from across most of North America, um, from southern Mexico through the United States and up into southern Canada. In the northern portion of the range, here in green, the species is an obligate migrant. Further south, it's either a facultative migrant, moving only when conditions require it to, or it's an annual resident year-round. Migratory shrikes start to arrive on their northern breeding grounds in late March or early April, and they will only breed there and then turn around and migrate back south by the end of by September. So really, they're only spending about five months of the year in Canada. Shrikes generally breed as one-year-olds, so in their first spring after hatching, Usually in the north, they're single brooded, but they are a very persistent renester, and they will attempt, I've seen up to four times to renest after having lost a clutch. In southern latitudes, double brooding is actually much more common, and the species has even known to pull off three, um, three successful broods in a year. Sometimes they will double brood in the north, but this usually relates to spring weather. So if there's an early spring with good weather and the pair is able to raise a brood successfully and still have time to do another brood, then they will double brood. So both sexes are involved in choosing the nest site and in building the nest. The nest is an open cup and it's made with small twigs. It looks very similar to that of a brown thrasher nest, but usually you can distinguish the two because shrikes like to line their nests with fur or feathers, whereas thrashers tend to use more vegetation like rootlets to line the nest. So the clutch size averages five or six eggs. The uh, incubation period lasts 15 to 17 days, and then the nestling period from 16 to 20 days. The female alone is the one that does the incubation. She's fed on the nest by the male. But once the young hatch, both parents are involved in feeding and caring for the young. Most research suggests that the species is monogamous in a season. However, there's been some interesting incidences in Ontario where there has been um, helper birds at a nest or multiple females contributing to a nest.
despite the fact that there's a diversity of habitat types, all the breeding territories typically have four common habitat features. The first is that they require a nesting area, which is usually a small tree or shrub, and the species shows some local preferences as to what these are. They also require elevated perches for hunting and for pair maintenance and for territory advertisement. They need food, cache, and impaling sites, and they need foraging areas, which generally are in the form of open short grass areas with scattered perches and some bare ground. In the prairies, the shrikes gen tend to place their nests in carrageenan shelter belts and shrubs like choke cherry, willow, and thorny buffalo berry. In Ontario, hawthorn and red cedar are the most commonly used. And this difference in nest shrub and tree species across the range is quite common. It's almost as if the bird has a learned preference for the most dense, protective, and thorny nest sites that will vary from place to place. Across the breeding range, shrikes tend to breed in loose aggregations. So the home ranges or territories which have the common habitat elements that I just mentioned are usually found within just one portion of a larger suitable habitat patch. And these patches can often fit several territories in one. And then the patches themselves are often um, in a landscape composed of, of many other similar patches of suitable habitat. Shrikes are really well known for their high rate of site reuse. And research to date suggests that the site reuse is actually linked to the size of the patch. So the number of years that a, a patch will be occupied tends to increase with increasing size of the patch itself. Shrike also has a very specific landscape level needs of habitat. So in some areas, it appears that the presence or occurrence of shrike correlates with the proportion of suitable habitat in the landscape. Um, research from Ontario suggested that there was a, th about a threshold level of suitable habitat that was required before you would get occurrence of the species. And this was somewhere between 15 and 25% of the area. So on the graph here, I have on the left-hand side, um, the uh, strikes per square kilometer of habitat. This analysis was done on a 10 by 10 kilometer square blocks, which was the, um, the size of the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas data set. And then we look at the bottom of the percentage of that square, which is suitable or restorable habitat. And as I said, somewhere here around 10 to 15 percent to 15 and 20, um, it seems to be where you need to have um, that level of habitat in the landscape before you start actually finding shrikes there. So in Ontario, um, where we're finding shrikes, they're associated largely now with the limestone plains where cattle grazing or unimproved pasture accounts for the majority of the land use. In Alberta, it's found that the density of breeding shrikes appears positively correlated with the density of trees and shrubs, farmyards, shelter belts, and right of way. So I like to think about this as this is our view of what good shrike habitat looks like but this is what a shrike's view of good habitat looks like. So it's not just the individual elements of the territory, but the landscape itself, which is very important to the species. So the subspeciation in loggerhead shrike was first examined in 1931 by Miller at the University of California using museum specimens and largely looking at differences in plumage coloration. Based on that, he decided that there were 11 distinct subspecies. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, a part of my PhD thesis was re-examining the taxonomy of subspeciation using genetic and morphological markers. So we, I did a broad-scale survey of shrike populations, um, sampled a, a feather and used uh, DNA extracted from that with nuclear microsatellites and assessed genetic population structure. What I found was that generally Miller's designations um, were well supported. So for example, here, number one in yellow is the Ludovicianus subspecies. Uh, the green areas represent excuterides. The blue areas are megrins. Um, what we did find though, was that the shrikes, oops, sorry about that. Shrikes from California down to Mexico appear to be the same um, subspecies rather than being different subspecies. We also found that um, 
there was a previously undiagnosed subspecies of shrike that occurred in northeastern North America. The reason probably being is that Miller's specimens did not include any representatives from those areas. Currently, Kosiewicz recognizes two designatable units of loggerhead shrike in Canada, the prairie subspecies, or Lanius pseudovicianus excubitoroides, which is shown here with green. And then in the east, um, the subspecies that's found in southern Ontario and Quebec, which we have provisionally named um, LL, or Lanius ludovicianus alvarensis, due to the association with um, alvar-type habitat. Um, alvars are an unusual habitat that's defined more or less as being naturally treeless areas on thin soil over essentially flat limestone or marble bedrock. And it occurs um, in particular around the Great Lakes region within the, the, uh, the range of loggerhead shrike. Based on breeding bird survey data collected since the early and mid 60s, Shrike populations have undergone one of the steepest, most drastic declines of any land bird in North America. They were once found throughout southern portions of Canada. So um, everywhere below this gray line used to be within their range. The species has become extirpated largely through the northeastern portion of its range with um, declines generally going from north to south and from east to west. In most areas, as depicted in red here, populations are undergoing a negative population trend, but there are a few areas where populations are actually increasing. So in Ontario, shrikes tend to be found in five core breeding areas and then sporadically also um, across the border in Quebec and the Oudouay region. Historically, they would have ranged as far from the Maritimes all the way through to eastern Manitoba. The Ontario population is currently listed as endangered. The species has declined from a high of about 50 pairs in the early 1990s, um, has gone down as low as 11 pairs in 2015. It's also now currently restricted largely to two core breeding areas, the Napanee and the Cardin limestone plains. Um, given that the species is believed to be extirpated throughout much of the remainder of the northeastern portion of its range, this population in Ontario, while small, is definitely a stronghold for the species. Unfortunately, the trend is similar in Western Canada, and while they are only um, considered federally to be threatened there, their populations have continued to steadily decline. And as in the east, uh, in Manitoba, for example, populations have really plummeted where now there's fewer than 50 breeding pairs being found annually in that province. Causes of decline are really not well known, um, and it's likely that there are several factors that are impacting the populations. Um, so vehicle collisions is a problem because the birds do like to hunt from utility wires along the roads and insects get attracted to the nice warm earth but it also um, presents quite a danger in terms of vehicles that, uh, that come along. Um, the species is known to be very susceptible to West Nile virus, at least in captivity, but we don't actually have a good idea of, of how wild populations have been impacted. Climate change is definitely becoming more of a factor. Um, and it's unfortunately not uh, a very clear picture. And at this point, we really only have anecdotal evidence um, I do study the species in a population in Illinois, and over the last decade, I have seen them start to breed up to two weeks earlier than they have in the past. So you would think that this would be good because then potentially they could become double brooded more often and raise more young annually. But what I'm actually seeing is that they get further along in their nesting cycle before the inevitable bad weather happens, and they tend not to renest at that point because their parental investment has been so high and probably also hormone levels are beginning to deplete. Predation happens uh, everywhere. It's a natural occurrence. Um, again, nothing um, in particular about it that would suggest that there are particularly high rates. The problem is where you get very small populations that even a few predation events can reduce the annual output dramatic, drastically. Habitat loss uh, definitely um, is a factor with the species decline. Um, there has been a loss of breeding habitat um, throughout the range, but um, also there's definitely areas that appear to have suitable habitat and appear to have it at the, the level, threshold level of which we need, and yet there are not shrikes there. 
um, in Alberta, researchers tentatively concluded that the population of shrike was limited by the availability of high quality habitat, but they didn't discount the possibility that the population was also limited by other factors as well. And generally, the research researchers, um, there is a consensus that there is more habitat than there is shrike, and that the migratory populations are suffering more than the ones that don't migrate. So what may be happening is that habitat loss in the wintering ground may be impacting the species when they go south. There may be direct, um, direct uh, impacts, such as simply loss of suitable habitat, but there may also be indirect impacts such as competition with residents that are there year round for the higher quality sites. Unfortunately, we really don't know that much about the wintering ecology of loggerhead shrike. Uh, the reason being because um, migrants overwinter throughout the range of year round residents for the large part, and you really can't tell the two apart in hand. But there's newer techniques that are coming to the rescue to help us address this critical knowledge gap. And in particular, stable isotopes has proven to be quite useful. So just a short primer on stable, um, stable isotopes, and in particular, deuterium, uh, which is one of the stable isotopes of hydrogen. So as you know, rainwater is composed of two hydrogens and an oxygen, but not all hydrogens are the same. There is a proteum isotope and a deuterium isotope. Deuterium has a neutron that proteum lacks, making it heavier. And so it, rainwater composed of hydrogen atoms that are deuterium isotopes, fall out more quickly in the rainwater um, in rain than do proteum. So you end up getting a pattern of heavier rainwater falling in the south. And as the storms move further to the north, the signature of the rainwater changes. What this means is that um, rain, the rain, uh, rainwater falls and of course it gets uptaken by plants. Insects eat plants and shrikes eat the insects. And so the signature of the stable isotope of that area gets incorporated into, into tissues such as feather. And so in feather tissue, um, the, it's actually a stable signature. So we can take a very small sample of a feather. And if we know that that feather was put on on the breeding ground or on the wintering ground, we can get an idea of where geographically that feather was molted. So for example, uh, in this, I'm going to sorry, just move my screen right here. Uh, so in this example, so we have two birds. Uh, they look to be the same, but one of them with a small sample of the first primary feather here has a stable isotope signature that's somewhere around minus 45 um, or so, which would put it somewhere here in Texas. Whereas this other bird looks exactly the same, take a feather, a small snip from the base of the feather here, and its value is more around minus 120, which would suggest that that feather was molted here in Manitoba. So this bird would be a migrant, whereas this bird would likely be a resident. So what this means is that we can go into um, across the species wintering range and sample birds taking about a centimeter from the tip of their first primary feather, which is always molted on the breeding ground, do uh, deuterium analysis, and then get an idea of what the breeding season origin of that feather was. So for example, this bird that was sampled here in Louisiana had a deuterium signature that suggested it was most likely from South Dakota area, which is in red but it's somewhat coarse in that it could have been potentially anywhere along that latitude. So for my thesis, I did actually um, go to populations throughout the states and I was able to develop an isoscape for the breeding grounds for shrike. And then I went back to areas throughout the wintering grounds and again sampled the shrikes there, not knowing if I was looking at migrants or residents at the time, but when the deuterium assays were done, we were able to determine um, that there is some patterns to the movements of migratory strike and that there are some hot spots actually. So um, this area, the top row is generally sort of the, oops, sorry, the Northeast. Um, and you can see there that um, there's both migratory and non-migratory individuals in each of the sample areas I went to. 
um, but that the Southern Carolina and Georgia, Georgia coastal areas had proportionately higher numbers of migrants than they did non-migratory loggerhead shrike. And then moving inland more to um, central, uh, central and eastern United States, Missouri and Arkansas and Mississippi, so essentially areas along the Mississippi alluvial valley appear to be very important as wintering grounds for migrant trikes. And then again, moving a little bit further to the west, um, throughout Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, and um, through most of Mexico, but not all the way um, to the far south in Michoacan, it appears that um, wintering, um, the wintering season has many more migrants than it does residents in the populations that we find there. So I did mention that um, loggerhead shrike is endangered federally in eastern Canada, and there has been a recovery program underway since the early 90s. Um, a recovery plan was first drafted for the species in 1991, um, but generally efforts in the east have been uh, separate from those in the west because it's felt that the populations were undergoing um, likely different limiting factors or threats. In the east, the recovery program is coordinated through Wildlife Preservation Canada and with several partners of which African Lion Safari is one, but we also have Toronto Zoo, the Nashville Zoo, Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, and then Conservation um, Halton or Mountsburg is a partner as well. So the recovery program is multifaceted, but can be broadly broken down into having three elements and they're very tightly linked. Uh, one is captive breeding and release of birds. Uh, second is wild population monitoring. And the third is habitat stewardship and outreach. The ultimate goal though, is to try to reestablish a viable population of loggerhead shrike in Eastern Canada. So I'll go through each of these briefly at this point, and I will start with captive breeding, which has been a main focus of efforts in Eastern Canada over the past two decades. An assurance population of Shrike was started in 1997 when the recovery team uh, met annually. It was looking at this extremely sharp, drastic decline, and it was feared that without intervention, we would lose the species altogether in Ontario. So over a course of two years, in 1997 and 1998, approximately 40 young wild birds were taken into captivity and since have formed the basis of our conservation breeding program. Initially, we moved birds from wintering facilities to large outdoor enclosures at field sites, which were located in historic shrike breeding habitat. However, more recently, what we've begun to do is to breed the birds at several um, at the, the wintering facilities, so African Lion Safari and Toronto Zoo, um, as I mentioned, and then the young birds themselves are transported to the large cages into the habitat where they are released. So we try to be as hands off as possible. Really, we're just supplying the necessities for the adult birds to do what they need to do. Staff provide them with nesting material and plenty, plenty and a diversity of food items. And we monitor the activity of the birds from a distance. So the parents will build a nest, uh, lay eggs, incubate, raise their young, all as if they were um, out in the wild. Once the young are independent from their parents, they're moved to one of these field release cages, which look very similar to the breeding cages actually, and they continue to be monitored there. So while the young are at the release site, they're banded with a stainless steel numbered federal bird band. And then they're also given a combination of three other plastic color bands. The combination will be unique for every bird so that we can individually identify them when they hopefully return in coming years. We also mark the birds with Sharpie. Um, and this is so that you can easily distinguish them um, in the cage and in the field after release, as it can be hard to see the color bands at times. So the young are introduced into the wild using a soft release technique. And this involves maintaining them in the release enclosures for at least two weeks, and they are able to acclimate to their surroundings and they're fed. When they are also exposed to wild predators, um, and wild prey, and they receive live mouse training to ensure that they can hunt and kill vertebrate prey on their own. Once they're released, they're given supplemental food at the release site for up to a week, and this helps them when they're gaining self-sufficiency. So since we started reintroducing birds in 2001, we've released nearly a thousand young to the wild. 
Every year, the majority of the young that are produced are released, but a few are held back, and this is to maintain the assurance population. The return rates for the captive bred birds have been in line with those with the wild birds, and in fact, in some years, even much, much higher. So in 2005, we had the first incident of a captive bred bird coming back to Ontario and successfully breeding with a wild mate. In 2010, we had the first pair in which both birds were captive bred and they again um, successfully raised young. Since 2016, captive bred birds have made up about one third of the population in Ontario and produce nearly half of the total number of fledglings that we observe. A population viability analysis, or PVA, showed that the release efforts had reversed the declining trend by more than 50% in Ontario and has kept the wild population from becoming extirpated. But not only do the released young augment the wild population, the captive birds have been instrumental in furthering research on the species that we simply can't do with wild birds. And one of the greatest contributions to this has been helping to identify migration routes and wintering grounds. While you can trap wild shrike in the field, you cannot retrap them. At least I cannot retrap them. Um, but since we maintain the captive bred birds um, in the release cages, we can monitor them over a period of time and ensure that they're healthy before we release them. And so we've begun to use both geolocator and VHF tags that collect data on the movements of the birds. More recently, uh, we're sticking strictly with MODIS or VHF type tags. Um, captive bred young have been fitted with various, uh, with the light sensitive um, geolocators and now these radio tags. The MODIS tracking system is a series of towers. It's a collaborative research effort coordinated by Bird Studies Canada. And here on this map, each yellow dot represents one tower in the very large scale radio telemetry network. And there are more being added annually. So we have placed MODIS receivers, um, which is this tower here, which is powered by a solar unit and a battery here. And so we've placed one of these in each of the two release areas um, in Ontario. So one in Cardin and one in Napanee. So the birds, the young are released each year from these areas. And this map gives you an example of uh, movements of one young bird that were monitored. So the red dot represents the bird that was released in Napanee, north of Kingston. And it, we can see that it made some different movements here, there, and everywhere before finally taking off and heading to the west down to where it was actually picked up in Point Peely on its first leg of its migration journey. So moving on to wild population monitoring, uh, this is also a very important aspect of the, um, of the program. So we do annual population surveys, and um, this allows us to track the size of the population and the reproductive success of the birds in the wild. It also provides us important information on the demographics of the wild population and allows us to determine the impact of the captive bred birds um, on the wild population. We also, as part of the monitoring, undertake a color banding program. This allows us information about site fidelity, dispersal, immigration, and even age structure of the population. So banding results really have been instrumental in helping us get a better understanding of the population dynamics of the species. So because of their predatory nature, shrike can be trapped using a walk-in style live trap. The traps are baited with a small pet, a pet store mouse, um, which is in a protective hardware cloth cage. So the trap is placed within sight of a shrike, and if all goes as planned, the shrike will come in to investigate the potential prey item and get trapped. And I actually have a short video of shrike trapping.
So each adult uh, gets one stainless steel band and again, three plastic bands. Again, together, they're a unique band combination for every adult. Um, we coordinate the color banding scheme across the species range so that no two birds are ever going to get the same combination in any year, allowing us to track movements both within areas but among um, different breeding areas as well. I'll give you just a brief highlight of results of work that I've done in Madewin National Tallgrass Prairie, which is located just south of Chicago. It has a very small population of loggerhead shrike that I've been studying since about 2005. And over time, even though the study methods are pretty simple, just going to find birds, monitoring their banding success and looking at reproductive success, we're beginning to get um, a better picture of the annual demographics of shrike. So I'll just walk you quickly through. In 2005, the yellow stars were where I actually had loggerhead shrikes. Um, Medewin has two sides to it, the west side and the east side, with a great big highway running right down the middle of the two. 2006, this is the results that I had. Again, looked like um, many of the same sites were being reused, but there was a lot of new sites popping up. 2007, again, getting a lot of use of the same sites. 2008, um, slightly fewer birds, so we lost them in some areas, but we were still picking them up in others. 2009, uh, really not a great year for shrike. They were congregated there, and then there was some as well on the west side, 2010. And so over time, what we're seeing is a really um, high site reuse rate. This, um, whoops, sorry. Uh, so we have up to seven years here of the same sites, and while you can't see it, the same nest trees being used year after year after year. While the longevity record for shrike in captivity is about 15 years, in the wild about 13, in reality shrikes are only usually breeding for two or three years. So what's going on here? When we start to actually look at the individual banding results, we discover that site reuse and site fidelity are not the same thing. So for example, in 2007, on my study site called West Patrol Road, I had an unbanded male, so I banded him in that year, had an unbanded female, I also managed to band her. Next year though, same nest tree, same site, um, a new unbanded male was there. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to figure out the status of the female. In 2009, yet another unbanded male showed up. I wasn't able to trap or band him that year. Um, the female that showed up was unbanded. So while she may have been the same in 2007 and 2008, she was definitely a different bird in 2009. And I again banded her. 2010 though, I have a banded male, but from a different site showed up. Um, at West Patrol Road, and again, an unbanded female showed up. So same areas, same nest trees, different birds. Which leads us to habitat stewardship, which is really the final piece of their strike reprogram, recovery program um, puzzle, and it's a critical piece. In Ontario and in many other areas, almost all of strike habitat is privately owned, and the maintenance of habitat suitability relies heavily on the continuation of grazing and heritage farming techniques in these areas. So by partnering with private landowners, we can undertake projects that help maintain cattle on their land and thus help maintain trike habitat. So typical projects in Ontario include building and maintaining fencing, installing water systems for cattle, clearing invasive species such as red cedars so that they don't overgrow pastures, um, and thereby protecting habitat. So um, shrikes are not doing badly only in Canada. As I mentioned earlier, they are um, in the top 10 declining land birds um, based on breeding bird survey data. The species has been identified in more than 37 state wildlife action plan lists and is listed as endangered or threatened in over half of the states within its range. So while conservation efforts for the species have been underway in both Eastern and Western Canada for decades, given the declining trend and the limited amount of time that shrikes are found in Canada, we clearly need to take a range-wide view and collaborate on efforts. 
As a result, in 2013, a group of individuals focused in eastern portions of the species range came together and we formed the Loggerhead Shrike Working Group. The priorities of the group are to identify causes of the population declines, quantify population demographics, determine the genetic identity of shrike in the Northeast, and to develop species distribution models characterizing habitat that will lead us toward the development of best management practices. Our activities are um, collaborative. We try to do the same thing in the same way in different portions of the species range and coordinate and then compare results. Um, the fieldwork is largely based on, again, banding, monitoring, and sample collection. And we are starting a citizen science project or Shrike Force, which we hope to launch in 2019. So the way that we do this is simply a, um, you teach one and then you, you learn and then you teach. So for example, I'm here in the middle uh, in West Virginia teaching Richard Bailey, the state biologist and his field assistant or mother, um, trapping and banding techniques for Shrike. So I stay until Rich feels comfortable working with the birds on his own. And then Rich in turn went to Virginia and worked with his colleague Sergio Harding on trapping and banding until Sergio felt comfortable on his own. And so in this way, we're, we're working together and we're training each other and we're doing things in the, in the same way. It also allows us um, coordination and collaboration on targeted research projects. So, for example, the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute was doing a health assessment, trying to gather baseline data on the wild birds and vets from SCBI would go out into the field with uh, the biologists from Virginia and West Virginia and collect blood samples. And this year in Ontario, we hope to be working with a vet and collecting blood samples to assess titers for West Nile virus in the blood. Field efforts are also a great way though for um, outreach to landowners. And um, they, it's a good opportunity for us to explain what the bird is and what it is that we are trying to do. And the results actually have already been, um, been really interesting. This is a really poor picture I recognize of a shrike here in a circle. This is actually at the Napanee release site in Ontario. This is a feeding corral where the young birds that are reared in captivity and released are provided food. This bird, however, was color banded. And when we looked at the video, we discovered that it's exactly the same bird that was banded by Sergio in Virginia in March or April as a breeding female of that year. It showed up here in Napanee in August of the same year at the release site. So we're establishing connectivity with other populations, but also learning interesting things about the dispersal behavior of the species. Finally, a critical part is that we need help and we need volunteers. As I mentioned, we're trying to initiate a Shrike Force, uh, which is a citizen scientist effort, and that would uh, support the efforts of researchers. Uh, we do have a website, www.loggerheadstrike.org, which outlines what the working group is doing and a little bit more about the Citizen Science, Science Initiative, which we're hoping to get off the ground in Ontario and Illinois and Ohio this year. A strike force is really just a network of citizen scientists that are working to locate and monitor loggerhead strike and thereby help to identify threats and develop strategies to mitigate these threats. The information from regions where strikes are still abundant will really help us interpret data from areas where the species is at risk. In Western Canada, um, it would be great if we could begin some banding and monitoring and establish some strike forces, and I'm hopeful in the coming year we'll be able to do so. Um, and then we're also developing data collection apps through um, ArcGIS collector and surveyor, and we're tying these to species distribution maps that we have developed when we're piloting. Um, this will help us direct volunteers to areas to go where they're most likely to find shrike. So if you're interested in learning more or forming a shrike force, please check out the website. And finally, in conclusion, I want to thank, um, there's so many people to thank really, um, the future strike really, it's not, it's not assured by any means, but the collaborations and the research that are underway provide hope. There's many, many people involved and these partnerships are all necessary for the recovery effort of strike. Um, so thank you to all. And if I missed anybody, my apologies. And with that, I think, uh, I, I guess I can take questions. 
Thank you, Amy. That was a really awesome presentation and your pictures were phenomenal. There are so many unique pictures there of Shrike. So thank you very much for, for sharing all of your your information with us today. Uh, we have a few questions from our listeners. Um, and to any of the listeners out there, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. Um, our first question is from a listener named Krista, and she's wondering if loggerhead shrikes experience nest parasitism from brown-headed cowbirds. As far as we know, no. Uh, there's one published study that examined this, and they did not find any parasitism. Um, and I have not heard or seen myself of, of any cowbird parasitism. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. Um, our next question is from a listener named James. And he said, loss of prey is not mentioned as a possible cause of population decline. Insect populations are much decreased to insecticides. And this in turn has resulted in populations of grass and songbirds, an important source of food for shrikes. Do you have any comments about that, Amy? Yes. That, that really is, um, we are very interested in looking at the diet of shrike and what it is that they're eating and, and when they're eating um, which. I, mean, I myself have seen a reliance on grasshoppers later in the season. Um, hatches of dragonflies are, are very important when they have fledged young. But it's a very um, complex question to address and I have a feeling that the answers are going to vary depending on where we look at it. Um, for example, in Ontario where the birds are found, there aren't a lot of crops and there isn't a lot of use of insecticides or even um, neonicotinoids that could indirectly reduce the prey base. Um, so I, I think it's going to vary depending on what the land use is and the application of, of those chemicals. Um, the other thing that makes it kind of complicated is that shrikes are, they do have this ability to take vertebrate prey. And while they do tend to prefer insect prey, they seem to be able to get through periods of rough weather, um, food shortages due to other reasons by switching over and reverting to taking other things like uh, small birds and snakes um, as well. And so they're able to you know, feed a lot of hungry young mouths that way. So it's something that we're, we're really hoping to begin to examine. And actually I have a small pilot project that I'm getting off the ground this year, where with new genetic methods, um, if you ever heard of the barcoding project, um, you can actually begin to identify what prey an, a bird has eaten by looking at its fecal um, sample, extracting DNA from it, and then screening the DNA with these markers. So it would at least give us an idea of what the bird is using, and then that can form the foundation for us to go out and start asking um, how those insect um, populations are are doing. And is the bird just relying on what's there, or does it have a real um, reliance on, on specific species? Thank you for that answer. Um, a listener named Michelle would um, says she worked with loggerhead shrikes in Saskatchewan over a decade ago, and it was very common for them to find shrikes in cemeteries, either nesting or hunting. Do you find this in the East or in the United States? Yes, we don't find it so much in the East, uh, but throughout the United States, I always joke that I had the most boring field work ever when I did my PhD, because all of my colleagues were going to Costa Rica and all these exotic areas, and I was going to um, trailer parks and cemeteries and abandoned farmyards. <laughs> so <laughs> when I was saying in the beginning that, you know, strikes are very flexible and they do occupy a, a wide range of, of habitat. Um, they're able to get their habitat needs met in a, in a variety of ways. And so um, when I asked actually working group members to send me some pictures of typical shrike habitat, several of them said, well, it's going to be parking lots and business parks and, and you know, parks in, in my city. So I definitely have seen this. Um, we're, we're beginning to get some work um, going in Texas, actually, where we're trying to look at sustainability of these habits, uh, habitats. So, you know, it could be that, yes, there's nesting shrubs and yes, there uh, is an insect prey base and there's nice mowed grass because the, the lawn is mowed in front of somebody's front yard. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a population source versus a sink. It could be that the birds think it looks good, but in fact, they're having very poor reproductive success. Interesting. Thank you for that answer. Um, 
Our next question is from a listener named Colin, um, and he would like to know if there are any co-species that tend to live with shrikes. Um, so, well, that, that's really interesting. The, the interactions that I see between different bird species um, out when I'm out studying shrikes is, is something that keeps me going back year after year to the same sites, and I always learn something new. Um, American kestrel, I've, I've seen them actually take shrike prey after shrike have impaled it on barbed wire. Um, it's not something that they do all the, all the time, but it's interesting. Um, I've seen brown thrashers actually reuse shrike nests after shrikes have been done either successfully or unsuccessfully um, trying to rear young in that nest. Um, northern mockingbirds and brown thrashers both probably are competitors um, in areas where habitat is limited. Shrikes tend to come back earlier than either of those two species, but they're really surprisingly not as aggressive. And so again, I've seen uh, thrashers displace a shrike off their nest and, and mockingbirds do the same thing where they just harass them to the point where the shrike gives up its nest and moves and, and goes somewhere else instead. So I've not seen anything that is more of a symbiotic relationship, but there's definitely um, interactions that go on that are just fascinating. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. How unique. Um, our next question is from a listener named Krista again, and she would like to know if a migrant bird can become a resident and ni not migrate back in the spring, or is a migrant bird always migrating? Oh, oh boy. Um, so that is an excellent question. Um, we don't have, so I have only one piece of empirical proof that a migrant bird could become a resident. And that is from my PhD when I was sampling shrikes on the wintering ground. I actually looked both at their genetic profile and their stable isotope profile to assign um, migrants and, and residents apart. The only bird genetically that I have ever found outside of Ontario that showed up, you know, looking like an Ontario bird essentially, was a breeding female in Louisiana. So um, I'd like to think that my lab techniques were not at fault, um, but I, you know, we, we don't know for sure. But I think given the long distance movements that we've seen, I actually myself think it's possible. Fascinating and probably unusual, but possible. Cool, thank you. Um, our next question is from a listener named Daniel, and he would like to know, for banding loggerhead shrikes in Canada, do volunteers need to obtain a bird banders license from the Canadian Wildlife Service first? Yes, they do. Um, and so the, the way that I have been um, working with other, uh, my, myself and other banders have been working is if there is somebody who has bird banding experience or is interested in becoming a bird bander, once they feel comfortable handling birds in general on their own, and so, you know, there's a lot of banding stations out there. Um, what I did was actually go to a banding space station for a couple of weeks and volunteered my time until I started feeling comfortable handling birds. And then trapping shrike has some specific um, uh, secrets. <laughs> so uh, usually what we try to do is if somebody's interested and they don't have experience, then we try to have them train with one of us. If they don't have their own banding permit, then um, we do have them. Um, I, I can sub people under my own master banner permit when I feel that they're um, capable of, of working on their own. Or if they have a banding permit already, um, then they, they could apply to get one. We are trying to coordinate the banding though. So um, that's kind of a, a critical thing that, that uh, we wanna make sure that people are using the combinations that don't overlap with other places and, and that they know what else is going on out there. Thank you. Um, our next question is from a listener named Eric, and he would like to know which invasive plant species are the most problematic, um, particularly to those in southern Saskatchewan? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I am not as well versed on southern Saskatchewan as I should be. Um, I do think that there's a fair bit of information on, on the web, and perhaps even, Caitlin, you could steer them to the right, the right people. Yeah, what about in general, like um, with the species that are the subspecies that you usually work with, um, is there a particular invasive species um, that's that's more problematic than the others? 
So in Ontario, red cedar is definitely a problem. And it, it's really interesting to talk to farmers that have been around for a while. Um, the Napanee limestone plain is now characterized by red cedar and it's the most commonly used nest tree um, species by, by shrike here. Whereas in the other core areas, hawthorn is more commonly used. When you talk to farmers though, the red cedar is a, a relatively new and invasive species. It carries a fungus that gets transferred to um, species of tree in the apple family. It's um, a rust. And so over time it weakens and eventually will kill, um, kill hawthorns and then the red cedar takes over. So, and red cedar when it takes over, really takes over. So the habitat just becomes overgrown with red cedar. So for us in the Napanee core area, trying to keep the red cedar density down is, is a major problem. Um, in Texas, surprisingly, there's also a problem with red cedar in some areas there, same sort of thing. It's very aggressive and takes over. Um, but it's also interesting that, so in Illinois where I work, Osage orange um, is now actually quite common, but it's not, uh, was not a native species, but it is now the most common shrub that shrikes will use. So, you know, again, shrikes make it, there's this thing that I like to call um, the shrike effect, and it means nothing is ever simple when it comes to the species. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. And Eric, if you still have questions, um, send us an email and we can give you a hand finding some more information uh, particular to Southwest Saskatchewan. Um, our next question is from a listener named Krista, um, and she would like to know um, what on the stable isotope slide that you had, what is mm -hmm. the y-axis on, on that slide um, with the Texas and Manitoba Shrike example? Um, yeah, so the y-axis was actually a different, it was a carbon isotope. Oh, okay. But I was hoping that nobody would notice that. <laughs> Krista's a, a follower of our PCAP webinar, so if anyone's going to notice, ah. it'll be her. <laughs> so hopefully that answers your, your question, Krista. Um, and the last question that we have is also from Krista, and more of a comment. Um, the difference between nest site reuse and nest site fidelity was very interesting and she's often been wondering if the strikes that she sees um, on the same shrubs are the same birds from last year. Um, and thank you for the, the great presentation, she says. So um, I guess with that, that's all the questions that we have. So thank you very much, Amy. This was a really, really right. interesting presentation and I know I learned a lot more about strikes than I ever could have imagined. So thank you very much for taking the time to, to share your experience and, and wisdom with us. You're very welcome. Thank you to all for your patience and listening. And thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. When you leave this webinar, a survey will pop up. And if you don't mind taking a minute um, just to answer a few questions, this will help us keep our funding and keep our webinar series going into the future. Um, and this presentation has been recorded and it will be uploaded to you, YouTube, the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future. So with that, thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.